I'll just read uh, the question. Now, what happened as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked, he asked them, that is Jesus, he asked the disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the old prophets has risen. So, Jesus asks a very simple question. He asks a very simple question. And he just says, who do those people, who do the crowds who follow me say that I am? And the, the disciples, uh, they simply repeat what we read, uh, what we read last week um, and what was repeated to Herod in verse, verses 7, 8 and 9. Herod the Tetrarch heard about what was happening and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been risen from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. So we see that the crowds have an understanding, a, a certain understanding of who Jesus is, but they have a wrong understanding. They have come down, come up with three answers, and all of them, while having some semblance of truth, are all wrong. Some say that he is John the Baptist. Some say that he's Elijah. Again, some others say that he is one of the prophets. And it's clear that there is no debate in the crowd's mind whether Jesus is special. All of those men listed, John the Baptist, Elijah, or the prophets, all of those are men who were anointed by God or given authority by God so that they could go forth and tell God's message. So the crowds understand that what Jesus is saying is important. What Jesus is saying has power. It has anointing. But the crowds have not realised the true reality of who Jesus is. They have, not re- they have not understood the true depth of Jesus' message. And even with what they have said, that he is John the Baptist, or he is Elijah, or he is one of the prophets, um, they have not understood even what, well, they're not acting like he, Jesus is any of those people. If you think to what the main message of those three groups of people, of those three people. John the Baptist, what was his, his message? John the Baptist arose in the area of Judea and he came forth preaching a baptism of repentance, of turning away from sin. Elijah's main theme in his ministry was of judgment that was coming and of a need for Israel to repent. And the prophets, of course, their, the, the summing up of their message was that Israel must repent. And while, of course, we do see that many of the crowd had come to follow Jesus and had come to, uh, come to repentance, a great number of them also had come just to see the miracles, just to see what was going on, just to see what the commotion was about. And so the crowds have an idea of who Jesus is, they have an idea of what his message is, but they are not acting like his message is true. And indeed, even with that, they do not realise what his message truly is. They do not realise who he really is. Everyone has an opinion, but no one has the right one. And as we sit here today, this is a question that we need to answer ourselves. What is our opinion of Jesus? What is our opinion of Jesus? And is it right? Are we content like the crowds seem to have been? Are we content to know something about Jesus. I know roughly what his main message is, but I don't know what he's really about. I don't know what he's really teaching. I don't know what he really wants me to do. Is Jesus simply just an idea, just a collection of theology, a collection of doctrines, a collection of teachings that you can you can agree with most of it. That's who Jesus is. Or is Jesus one of a great number of, of teachers? that the world has around us? Is he just, just a little bit better than Martin Luther King? Or he's just a greater version of Plato or Aristotle? He's a great philosopher. Or is he just a, a nice teacher? He just tells you, just live a nice life. Do good things. Don't hurt people. Or is he just, well, he's just, he's just a prophet. Like the, like the Muslims would believe, Jesus is he's special, he's come along, he's special, he's clearly special, just like the crowds. He's clearly special, he's clearly got something about him, but he's just a prophet. He's just a man. Or is he just 
a myth or is Jesus just a legend? Well, that is the question, isn't it? That is the question that is asked. Who is Jesus? And we must answer the question and we must come to, the, come to a conclusion and we must be able to answer it for ourselves. Who is Jesus? Well, we've seen a question. The next thing we need to see is a confession. The next thing we need to see is a confession. And this comes from the lips of Peter. Peter, the, the apostle, never one, to, uh, never one to keep quiet. And he tells us what, the, what our answer should be. He tells us what our answer should be. So in verse 20, following his first question, Jesus asked this. He, then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter answered, the Christ of God. So Jesus zooms in. He's first asked, who do the crowds say that I am? Who do all of those people who don't spend a load of time with me, who do they say that I am? And they have come up with this list, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. But he, he zooms in, and indeed I want to zoom in today. What about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? This is a question, as I've already said, this is a question we all must answer. This is not just a question for those people out there who aren't in church today to answer. This is a question for us to answer here today. We must be able to think to ourselves, what is our answer? Or we, we see Peter's answer, as I've said in verse 20, the Christ of God, or you are God's Christ. This is an amazing Phrase, the Christ of God, God's Christ, God's Messiah, in other words. This is uh, the Greek version of, yeah, the word Christ is the Greek version of Messiah. Messiah was the Jewish word for the anointed one, the promised one, the one to come. And it essentially boils down to meaning the saviour, the saviour. And so Peter's declaration, you are the saviour of God. You are the saviour of God. You are God's saviour. Not that he's saved God from anything, but that he is God's chosen saviour. And this is a significant statement. This is not just some run-of-the-mill saviour. I wonder in your experience, have you ever been saved from something? In my previous job, as I've already said, I was an outdoor activity instructor. And part of that meant that I went paddling on whitewater rivers. Now, you may have seen some of that going on in the Olympics, but I did it in proper rivers, not man-made ones. And sometimes you'd fall in, and you'd be bubbling down the river, and you'd hope that someone would throw you a rope from the sides, because otherwise you're going to go down the waterfall, and that might be a bit too much fun. But I wonder if you, can have, a, you have a similar story of being saved. Indeed, I saw uh, last night on the BBC, it said... Uh, that some of the coaches from Team GB at the Olympics had saved someone's life. This man has, had gone into heart attack. He'd had a heart attack and they had saved his life. They'd done CPR on him and they had restarted his heart with... Um, I can't remember the name of it now. A defibrillator, that is, that's what it is. They have saved his life with a defibrillator. And indeed, as I searched through uh, the BBC website, I saw that they, they used the word saviour quite a lot most often for sporting events. They're the saviour of this team, the saviour of that team. Uh, one town, they have been saved by some new flood defences. There's another man who saved Jews from the Holocaust. And doctors and vets and other people like that are described as saviours. But if I talk to you about those people, are they saviours to you? Are they saviours to you? Well, no, they're not, are they? They aren't a saviour to you personally, because they've saved a particular person or a particular team or a particular town has been protected from a danger. They are just a local saviour for that person or that people or that place at that time. None of them have done anything for you and, in the, and indeed none of them have done anything for me. But not so with Christ. You, do you, Peter is described in your God's Christ. Jesus is God's Christ. And so he is more than just a saviour for the twelve disciples, 
He's more than just a saviour for the 5,000 that we read about last week. He's more than just a saviour for those people who found themselves between the edges of this book, the Bible. He is a saviour for all people at all times. Indeed, he is a saviour for you. Jesus is rejected by the establishment, but he is recognised by the disciples as the saviour of the world. And you see that in the following verses, in verse 21 and 22. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So all of those who knew anything about anything were going to reject Christ at that time. But the disciples, the fishermen, the lowly of, of that society, they had discovered the truth, that they had discovered the Christ of God. He is the saviour. And Peter saying this is more than just a statement of fact, although of course it is a statement of fact, but it is a controversial statement at that time. He is facing down the Jewish establishment by saying that. He is stating that Jesus is the saviour, that the establishment has been waiting for, but that they have rejected And again, we need to ask the question of ourselves, is this us? Have we seen Christ and we've seen the good that he is and and what he teaches, and yet we've rejected him? Have we rejected Christ because of some issue that we have with how he is? Or have you accepted him fully like Peter and the apostles had? Can we say with Peter, you are God's Christ, you are the Christ of God? Jesus says to you today, who am I? That is uh, why I've titled the sermon as it is. Who is he? Who is Jesus? Or are we we those who, well, he's quite good. Jesus is good. He's good, but he's got some some good qualities. I quite like uh, his teachings on on this area of of living. But, well, that one, I, I quite like the way I do it. Quite like the way I do it. I could consider, consider having Jesus in my life. But not that bit, that bit, that bit's mine. I don't want Jesus to actually be in control of my life. That would be a bit too personal. That would be a bit too invasive if Jesus was in charge of that area of my life. You can fill in the blanks as to what your area of life that might be. Jesus is not like buying a house or a car where, oh, that bit's really nice, but oh, that bit, I wish it wasn't like that. It's not like buying a puppy or buy, buying a phone. Some, bit, some bits are brilliant, some bits are a bit of a drawback. Well, no, Jesus is not like that. Jesus is the answer to all of our problems here today. And he is the saviour. And we need to ask the question, is he a good enough saviour for you? Because he is a good enough saviour for God. And so, as we finish the second point, we must ask the question, are you with Peter or are you with the crowd? Are you with Peter or are you with the crowd? You're here today. You, you've obviously understood something of the importance of coming to church, of hearing the word of God. But have you made a decision or are you um in and ah in here? Oh, he's, he's quite good. He's John the Baptist. He, t- he tells us about all of these things. Or he's, he's Elijah. He tells us how to know God. He's the prophets. But, well... Oh, I want to pull back away from from actually being my saviour. Are you with Peter or are you with the crowds? Because we finally come to, well, we come to the final point. The final point is this. The final point is a cost. We've seen the question, who am I? Who do the crowds say I am? Who do you say I am? We've seen the confession. Peter says, you are God's Christ. And then we come to the cost. Because there is a cost of declaring that. There is a cost of that confession. And what is it? Well, we read verse 23 through to verse 26. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. 
For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. We must deny ourselves. This is an absolute necessity. This is speaking of a self-forgetfulness. This isn't sort of self-denial, as some of us may know it. Sort of, I'm giving up crisps for Lent. That's not, that's not the sort of thing that we're talking about here. There's no chocolate for Lent. That, not that kind of thing. This is a self-forgetfulness. The word here is, is the same word used about Peter when he denied who Jesus was. Now, of course, we do not want to deny who Jesus was, but we want to deny ourselves. I don't know that man or that woman. I don't know that man. I've stepped away from that old man, that old Peter, speaking about myself, that old Peter who had those wicked and sinful desires. I do not want to know him. I want to deny him his desires. I want to be a one who goes after Christ. I am Christ's, not mine. That is what this is speaking of. Not what I want, but what my Saviour wants. Not what I would do, but what the Saviour would do. It's not about me, it's all about him. Is this Christianity that I'm speaking of? Is this described by, well, I turn up to church every third Sunday. I, I come along when it's convenient, when there's nothing else on. Or is it described by Galatians 5, 24? And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I, I said this uh, on Tuesday at the prayer meeting, but I'll say, say it again. What is church to you? What is church to you? What is the defining moment of, of church? Well, it's obviously the coffee that's coming after the service. Or it's the cake, or it's the kids' club. Or it's just it's a really convenient time for me. It doesn't clash with any of the other more important uh, things that I've got going on in my week. It doesn't demand too much of me. It doesn't demand too much of my time. It doesn't require too much commitment. Or no, none of those things must be the thing that define us and our Christianity or define our church. That cultural Christianity is not one that saves. Jesus speaks here, if anyone would come after me, anyone here who wants to come after Jesus today, you must do this. Let him deny himself, forget himself, forget his desires, take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross. Now what does that mean? Is that wearing a little cross necklace? Or maybe you put one of those fish stickers on the back of your car to show that you're a Christian? Well, no, it's not, it's not that at all. To take up your cross in that time was the march of the condemned, the man taking his last few steps towards death as he walks up that hill to where the stake is in the ground, where he will be nailed to that cross and where he will die. This is the t condemned man going to the gallows. This is a one-way ticket. And that must be what a Christian's life is. It must be what a Christian's life is. A one-way ticket. But hold on. Peter, you said a few minutes ago that there is no drawback to following Christ. Well, this is the thing that I want to present to you today. I would say that there is no drawback to Christ, but you must count the cost yourself. It's not something I can make you do. It's not something I can force you to do. But you must... Count the cross yourself, as Jesus says. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? As you sit here today, if I asked you the question, what are you worth? How would you answer that question? How would you answer the question, what are you worth? What are you worth? Well, would you uh, pull up numbers on a screen that show how big your bank account is? 
Or you'd say, well, I, I own three houses and two holiday properties. Or you'd say, well, I've got a really big family. I've got a really big family. That shows me how much I'm, I'm worth. I've got a beautiful wife. Or I've had, I've had a long string of, of women or a long string of men. Or I live in a really nice part of the neighbourhoods. Say, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm a man. I'm just, that, that's what gives me, that's what gives me uh, value. I've got this many followers on Instagram or on Facebook. What gives you purpose in your life, or what what is your aim? Is it just accumulating wealth to hoard, to sit back on as you retire? Or what makes you proudest as you look back on your life? What was the crowning achievement of your life? Well, Jesus says in these verses, pile all of that onto the scales. Put it all on the scales. And you will find it is outweighed by the weight of yourself or of your soul, as other, other uh, passages say. All that you have, all that you could earn, all that you could gain in this world, put it on the scales and see how, what it weighs compared to your soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You can look fairly easily to the richest in the world and you can see that they are, they are fulfilling that, those words that Jesus has said. You look to Elon Musk or you look to Jeff Bezos, men who are rich beyond belief. They, enough, they have enough money to send rockets into space and not care if they explode. But do they know God? No, they don't. Neither of those men show any signs of spiritual life. And so, would you trade your spiritual life for theirs? For the riches that they have? Owning the entire world could not make you worth more or less in this working out. Your soul is the most important thing, says Christ. He says, lose everything but your soul. For everything else is worthless compared to having your soul and saving it. You can see it easily, can't you? You can see the businessman who spends his entire life building that vast wealth, as I've spoken of, accumulating immense wealth and power. But at the end of, uh, end of his life, where does it go? Well, it goes to any heirs he has, and he gets to take none of that with him into the next life. Or you look at the Olympians that we see on the TV at the moment. Men and women who have spent their entire lives dedicated to this one goal of being so physically fit for this specific activity. And what does that gain them? A gold medal? A silver medal? Maybe they come forth and they get nothing. They've dedicated their entire life to that thing, but what does it gain them spiritually? Of course, I'm not saying that to be rich or to, uh, to take part in the athletics or to do those things is wrong or in any way wicked, but if those things are done apart from spiritual life in Christ, they are of no value. Indeed, Paul, the Apostle Paul, says that he looks back on his life, his perfectly spiritual life, where he followed the Jewish law as perfectly as he could. He describes himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. And he looks back on that as dung, he calls it. It's rubbish to him because he didn't love Christ. So we must be those. We must be asking ourselves this question. What is there in our life that is worthwhile? Do we love Christ? Do we know Christ it is appointed for a man once to die and after that face bankrupt not bankruptcy to face judgment and so we must count costs that's why I mixed up the word bankruptcy I'm going to say the next question has anyone here been bankrupt or you've lost your house or your car or you've lost money on an investment Perhaps you sit here today, you've got the clothes on your back and nothing else. Well, if you sit here today and that describes you, you're just the, the bailiffs are at the door. 
I've got nothing left, you say. Well, I can tell you this. You can leave this church as the richest man in the entire world because you can know Christ. Does that sound like a good deal to you? You could leave this church as the richest man or the richest woman in the world because you can know Christ. Jim Elliott said this, the missionary who spent his his life, he went out to reach uh, tribes in Ecuador, a man who was tragically murdered by those same tribes he was trying to reach with the gospel, he said this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Have you done that today? Have you given what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose? Or are you on the other side of that equation? You sit here today and you would have pulled out your bank account. That is how much I'm worth. I don't have Christ, but I've got all of these things. All of these things, they, they, they all stack up. They, I look quite good. You might be far richer than I am here today, but if you do not know Christ, it doesn't matter. You leave here as the poorest man or woman here on earth because you have nothing compared to what you can have in Christ. And that's your choice. That's your choice. You can answer the question however you want to. You can say, it's John the Baptist, he's just, he's just a man. He's just a man telling us some things. He's just Elijah. He's just one of those prophets. He just says some good stuff. You can say that. The Bible commands you not to say that, but you can. Or you can answer, you are God's Christ, and then that results in him being your saviour, but also your Lord. He must be your saviour and your Lord. You must turn everything over to him. You... If you sit here today, you do not know Christ, you haven't turned to Christ, you are robbing yourself of eternal life. A robbery that puts the great train robbery, uh, just forget about that, this is the greatest robbery of all time. You are robbing yourself of eternal life, You're condemning yourself to eternal death. Do not be ashamed of Christ and his gospel, as Jesus says. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Do not be ashamed of Christ and his gospel. But you sit there, what about my reputation? I've built a reputation on living this way, of living according to the world's way, of idolising the earth, of getting as much money as possible, as much Riches as possible, doing everything that the world wants, looking as cool as I can. I've worked so hard for my lifestyle, my car, my house, my relationships. Well, all, all you are saying is that I'd rather have those things now for a short time than I would rather have Christ in eternal life. And you have to answer the question, can they possibly be worth more than eternity in heaven? The answer clearly is no. We must be ashamed of those things and we must adore Christ. Have you trusted in Christ today? Have you forsaken yourself, as it says? Have you denied yourself? I do not know that old man. I am a new man. I am a new creation in Christ. Have you turned to him as your complete saviour? Or are there still areas of your life which... Those are mine, Jesus. Those are mine. Don't touch those. Those are mine. He offers and promises you eternal life in himself for all who simply believe. If you sit here today, as I've already said, if you do not know Christ, you must ask yourselves these questions. What more could you possibly want from Jesus Christ? What is there that is great or is good or is powerful that is not in Jesus Christ? What is there that is in any way respectable or beautiful or praiseworthy that is not in Jesus Christ? 
What is there that is adorable or endearing that is not in Jesus Christ? Is there anything that you can list in all of this world that is in any way good that you could not find perfectly in Jesus Christ? Is Christ not honourable enough to be worthy of you? Oh, Jesus, if I accepted you, that would be such a favour on my part. Are you above being dependent on Christ? The Lord of the universe is below you. Or is he he's not high enough to be appointed to such a great work as your salvation? Or has he not been made low enough? Has he not suffered enough on that cross for you that he would be worthy of taking you in? What is there that Christ lacks? What is there that Christ does not have that you could add to him to make him more perfect, to make him worthy, to make him fit to be your saviour? Again, the answer is nothing. There is nothing that can make Christ more perfect. So we must be proud to be Christ's. Christians, this applies to us, of course, as well. We must be proud to be Christ. We mustn't be afraid of man in any way, shape or form. As we discuss what we've done at the weekend, what do we say? I've been to church, I've heard of Christ's gospel. I went to the beach on Saturday. No, we must be proud of Christ. We must be proud, we must proclaim his gospel. Again, we ask the question, are we more afraid of man's opinion that we are of God's opinion? Are we ashamed of our saviour who who for your sake took on himself the shame of the cross? (coughs) Again and again we must realise that there is nothing in us that makes us worthy of his saving grace. We must realise there is nothing in us that makes us worthy of his salvation. It is all of him, his death on the cross It's all of him, all his work. And so we see that there is a cost for us, but also there was a cost for Christ. The true cost of the cross was this. It cost him his life. He came to earth to suffer and die for you, if you will accept him as your saviour. Because if we look at the cost for us, the cost of this, Oh, it's uh, 80 years or so for eternity in heaven. And that's no cost at all. I've heard it described as this way. I don't know if you've ever been, uh, if you've ever been camping, but when you go camping, there's, there's a string that holds up the tent, and at the end of it, there's a little black thing that's about this long. Okay, there's a little black bit of plastic, like that, that, that size. And... Uh, and you must imagine that the string of the tent goes all the way around the world several times. Is that little bit of plastic worth it? You want to keep that little bit of plastic and trade all of that in. Get rid of the rope. But you can trade in the bit of plastic and take, take all of that rope. Take all of that rope. You can have everything. You could have everything you wish for and more in heaven because it will be perfect. The cost of the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ was an immeasurable death, on an unfathomable depth of suffering, sacrifice born out of love for his people. As he was on the cross, he bore the crushing burden of humanity's sin, their shame, their brokenness. Every moment on that cross, an unwavering Commitment to redeem a fallen, a broken world. The agony of the nails driven into his hands and feet. The excruciating pain of crucifixion as he suffocates on dry grounds. The unimaginable spiritual anguish of bearing the wrath of God for our transgressions. And he did it so that you may know him. His cry, it is finished. We hear the triumphant declaration of a love that has conquered sin, has conquered death, has opened the gates of eternal life for all who will believe. The cost of the cross was nothing less than the very life of the Son of God. 
given so that we may be reconciled to the Father, transformed by his grace. This act of love, this cross demands, it demands and commands your total surrender to him. It calls us and commands us to take up our cross, our cross daily and follow him. As I've said before, there are things in our, in our lives that we should be ashamed of. I don't need to fill in the gaps, you can do it yourself. There are things in your life today that you should be ashamed of, which you are not. There are sins in your life that you've kept hold of, perhaps for years, for decades. We must be rid of those things, we must take up our cross daily. We must be crucifying ourselves, crucifying our sin daily. But we must not be ashamed of Christ. Christ is worthy of everything that we have. Is he worthy of everything that you have? Is he worthy of everything in your life? Or is this just something for those those weird people who are a bit spiritual? We must be those who can say that we have given all to Christ. And he has given all to us. Amen.